Hello everybody, this is going to be 6.1, the Roman Republic, and we are going to start with um, the geography of Rome. So, uh, if we're looking at Italy, Italy is a peninsula, that means it is surrounded on three sides by water. Uh, famously, it looks like a boot, uh, and it is just north of Africa. The city of Rome is about in the middle of Italy along the Tiber River. It, it actually uh, is slightly inland of the Tiber River. They didn't build right on the coast. Uh, this was good for them because they could expand north and south, and they also had the river for protection uh, and for clean water. Now, compared to Greece, Italy was a lot less rocky. There was a lot more farmland, which meant that uh, it was better for farming and for trade. And also it was easier to travel because even though there were mountains, the Apennines, uh, they were not as high um, <coughs> as, and they were not as uh, uh, difficult to cross as the ones in Greece. Uh, also, we had the Alps up north. They were pretty high, and that did a good, very good job of keeping out uh Rome's enemies, except, of course, for Hannibal and his elephants, but we'll get to that in 6.2. So we see the Tiber River right there in the middle uh, along the Apennine mountain range, uh, but that uh, Rome is uh, a little bit inland of the Tiber River. Now, the first cultures in Italy uh, appear in about 800 BCE, and they were called the Latins, which is why we call their language Latin. Uh, they are the ancestors of the ancient Romans, and they settled around the area of Rome. Now, according to myth, Rome was founded by two twin brothers, Romulus and Remus, who were raised by a female wolf. Uh, eventually, Romulus founded the city of Rome after he killed his brother in a fight. The rest of Italy was settled by the Greeks, and uh, they settled into uh, an area up north, uh, and they sort of uh, intermarried and created a group called the Etruscans. Uh, the Etruscans uh, had a big influence on Roman uh, civilization and culture. Uh, the Romans borrowed their arches and their fashions uh, when they started to become more popular. So here are Romulus and Remus being raised by the wolf mother. Now, in 509 before the Common Era, Romans became a huge force in Italy, and they defeated the Etruscans, um, and they had just removed a king who they didn't like, and they weren't in favor of creating another king, so they set up what's called a republic instead. Uh, and in a republic, it is the people who elect their leaders, and that is an important term, so make sure you star that, write it down, underline it, all of that good stuff. Um, the, the thought was that as long as the people were in charge, there's not one person in charge, so it's a lot harder for one person to seize power and take control. Uh, and this is different from things like where we see the direct democracy of Athens, where citizens vote on all major issues. In this situation, you vote for people who vote for you instead. Now, a Roman Republic had three different social levels. It had the patricians, who were the upper class. Uh, at first, they were the only ones who could hold office in Roman government, although that would change later on. We also had the plebeians, the farmers and the merchants, who were uh, underneath them and could not, at least at first, hold elected office. The lowest were the enslaved, the people who were captured in wars and uh, were forced to work. So here we see the... Uh, the social order, the patricians, the plebeians, the slaves, and uh, this one adds uh, the freemen as well, freed slaves. Um, now, politically, Romans had a 300-person senate, uh, which was entirely of the upper-class patricians, again, at least at first, and they debated and they uh, voted on important political issues. Now, every uh, year, two senators were chosen to be the consuls. Uh, the consuls were in charge of the armies, and they handled government business, and uh, they were, there were two of them because they were meant to sort of balance out each other's power. So in times of emergency, the senators could appoint a one-person head of Rome uh, to sort of be the big guy in charge. Uh, this is known as a dictator. Um, and they had absolute control for a short period of time. And then at the end of it, they were supposed to give it up, although that didn't always happen. They were expected to give up their power. Um, so here is what a meeting of the Roman Senate might look like. 
And here is Cincinnatus, one of these famous dictators. Uh, he is a Roman dictator who uh, led the Republic during a time of war. Uh, after the war, he uh, returned to his farm, which makes him a great example of a dictator who gave up his power. Uh, he was willing to uh, give up all the powers of dictatorship and head home. Um, and sometimes George Washington is called the American Cincinnatus because he gave up his presidential power after eight years. Now, over time, like I kept saying before, at first it was only the patricians who had political power. However, over time, the plebeians got more and more power, and they started to um, gain more rights. Uh, they started to gain the ability to vote. Uh, eventually, they got the chance to elect their own leaders, the tribunes. Um, and the tribunes could block the uh, power and the laws of the Senate, especially if they felt that they were being unfair to the plebeians. And this is known as a veto. Veto is Latin for I deny. Eventually, they worked their way all up into the councils and into the Senate, and it was no longer just for the patricians after that. Uh, we can still see this, by the way, the legacy of this Roman government in America. We have an upper house called the Senators and a lower house called the House of Representatives, uh, and they can sort of block each other's power, just like the uh, senators and tribunes of ancient Rome. Uh, the president these days has the ability to veto uh, bills that he doesn't like. Now, uh, men were pretty much entirely in charge of these families in ancient Rome. Uh, however, over time, women were able to gain a modicum, a slight amount of more power, including the power to own businesses. Certain women could. Uh, we also see that wealthy patrician women could fund the arts and pay for festivals. Uh, overall, they still had more power than Greek women, for instance. Uh, many Romans, though, learned how to read at a young age. Uh, wealthy Romans had tutors for their kids. And now Romans were polytheistic, um, and it seems that they borrowed or sort of incorporated the Greek gods into their own pantheon. Um, we see the powers and the responsibilities of the gods are very similar between the Greeks and the Romans. Uh, and the Romans held many festivals and celebrations throughout the year to honor the gods and goddesses, and they had a lot of temples built to them as well. So here is uh, an example. Zeus uh, became Jupiter. Uh, he was the king of the gods, and he was the king of the gods in Rome as well. Now, over time, the Roman Republic continued to grow and continued to conquer, and by 250 BCE, it had conquered almost all of the Italian peninsula. And one of the reasons they were so effective was they had a very powerful army made up of citizen soldiers called legions. Uh, each legion had about 5,000 men, and they had several legions. Um, they were paid for, uh, or they got their money from winning, uh, if they won, they got to sort of ransack the place. Uh, and they were also very harshly punished for crimes or for uh, cowardice in battle. Romans uh, also enslaved their defeated enemies. Uh, however, if they negotiated, they might be able to keep their customs and their money and possibly even eventually marry into Roman citizenship. Eventually, Rome united Italy under the common language of Latin, and they set up a solid infrastructure with roads and aqueducts and water that... Uh, traveled, and so they built, you know, Roman roads were famous. Uh, so here's what a uh, Roman legion might have looked like at the time. And we'll uh, look at the switch from Roman republics to an empire in the next section, the last section.